Welcome to All Things Green. I'm Shelby, here with my co-host Anton, to discuss a variety of topics from across the sustainability universe. Anton, how are you? I'm doing wonderfully. How are you doing today, Shelby? I'm doing well. We've talked about the weather here, and I know that's boring small talk, so we won't get into it too much, okay. other than to say that it's finally getting warm, which... yeah. For those of us that's in Northeast Ohio, seems like good news because we've had a cold spell, but it was actually kind of a mild winter. Did you notice that? Yeah, it was mild. It was mild, but it doesn't make me want summer any less. Yeah, that's true. But in climate-related news, the reason we had such a mild summer was because we were in the middle of what's called a La Nina, which essentially is just um, a terminology for when we're going through a, a year that's more mild in general and we are heading into an el nino Mm. which means that we'll probably have a hotter summer a colder winter um and according to several recent resources we're probably heading into the hottest summer on record so i don't want to on record like ever yeah ever wow I'm still excited for summer, but of course this has impacts beyond just the fact that you and I here in Northeast Ohio will probably have a beautiful summer. Um, it also means globally, like more heat related, heat related deaths, yeah. uh, more extreme weather events in general, and someday down the line a little further, probably more climate migration. So Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I guess you'll be seeing me at the uh, the beach this summer. It'll be Pretty toasty. I know. I hate to kind of dampen the mood of all the fun things we're going to do this summer with <laughs> with climate realism, but that's where we are. So um, maybe we should start talking about ways that we could be addressing this. I think we're talking mostly about policy and government today, Yeah. Uh, sort of a theme. And so we'll get started with talking about a bi-national deal between the U.S. and Canada. Does this sound exciting to Yeah, you? this sounds really interesting. Yeah, so I was doing a little bit of research. I wanted to be able to bring us something um, that talked about ways that policies and government are working toward progress on climate change. And so one thing that's happened recently, this was reported, um, my primary resources were out of WXYZ, which is the Detroit NPR affiliate station, and also the Washington Post, a little bit of coverage in both of those. So uh, recently there was a joint announcement made in the city of Detroit in the U.S. between the U.S. and Canada um, from Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg Mm. um, announcing the first of its kind binational electric vehicle corridor. Wow. So it's like a like a highway for electric cars or? Yeah, exactly. So a regular car could drive on this highway. It's not EV uh, exclusive. Okay. What makes it an electric vehicle corridor is just that it's actually set up to help people be able to charge their electric vehicles along the way. Oh, that's neat. So right now there isn't a good way for you to go that long of a distance, um, especially crossing countries if you're driving an electric vehicle because you need to stop and recharge. And while most roads have gas stations that are pretty accessible when you're taking those sort of long distance travels, the same is not currently true for electric Mm. vehicles. So this is the first time the two countries have come together and said, we're gonna put in a road where approximately every 50 miles, no more than every 50 miles, there will be an EV charging station. It'll be one of those DC fast chargers, so it should be able to charge vehicles at a reasonable rate of time. Okay. Get up, get on your way, back to old Canada, and (laughs) yeah, do what you do in Canada, right? I guess so. You just (laughs) go pick up maple leaf-related merchandise and, you know, go to Timmy's. That's what what I hear. Um, and all jokes aside, this is this is really cool news. I love yeah. the idea that the two countries are working together. We've put forward a real plan to make this happen. Um, we've talked before about our sort of mixed feelings about EVs. Yes. I don't know if you want to touch my, on My feelings aren't as mixed. I think uh, EVs aren't the way of the future. It's got to be like public transportation, trains, <laughs> uh, pedestrian walkways, and, and cycling ways. Uh, of course, you know, a highway from... Uh, Michigan to Canada is not going to be so much like you're going to walk there or or bike there, uh, but a train is more feasible, and I would I would love to see maybe future investment in a train of some sort to get 
from A to B. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm on board with all these other options too. There are some sectors right now that primarily run on vehicles, like yeah. gas powered vehicles that might want to be able to transition to EVs. Yeah. Especially when I think about the actual transportation sector, some things are transported on trains, yeah. but we see a lot of just semi trucks. And I know that there's work going into making more of those electric vehicles. So while I'm on your side, and I think that we learned um, from our guest, uh, John McGovern previously, that McGovern. <laughs> then there's lots of ways that we should be thinking about just reducing how much we're reusing vehicles yeah. in the first place. If we're going to have them, I like this story. It's going to go yeah. all the way from the city of Kalamazoo in southeastern Michigan to Quebec mm. City. So um, it'll be approximately 860 miles that oh, people can travel. Way. Yeah. Um, this, by the way, is part of a larger U.S. plan to invest in more than 500,000 EV chargers in the U.S. Um, and they also hope that this will boost the sale of electric vehicles and create some jobs around maintaining electric vehicles, working at the places where you can charge electric vehicles, yeah. et cetera. So we talked about green jobs in the past. The hope is that this will create more yeah. green jobs too. That would be awesome to create more green jobs that way. And I'm curious, are these like going into like current gas stations? Are they like subsidized and going into currently owned businesses or? That's a really good question. I'm yeah. not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it wasn't it said explicitly in the articles that I read, but we can certainly do some extra research yeah. and put it in the show notes. Right now, this is just a plan. Yeah. So we might learn a little bit more of the details along the way. You already talked about some of the other things that you might prefer sure. over EVs, but <laughs> when you think about an investment like this, um, mm -hmm. where are other places that you think we should be investing with large-scale kind of binational uh, work, if you have any thoughts there? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, living in Ohio, I would love to just see like a... Uh, Cleveland to Columbus to Cincinnati uh, railway or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, even for people who have EVs, like, sure, invest in the EVs. Make that uh, an accessible route as well. Um, along the Lake Erie uh, shoreway from Cleveland to Sandusky, that north shore, mm -hmm. north coast, um, I personally would love to just hop on the train and head to Marblehead, uh, Sandusky, and, like, do some birding. So, I mean, if anybody's out there who can... Make that happen. Make it happen. Anton's totally <laughs> non-biased opinion on yeah. where we need to put yeah, our transportation exactly. dollars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so while you might have some other preferences for where yeah. those dollars should go, I'm, I'm excited about what this means yeah. uh, for the collaboration between the two countries and some real investment in, yeah. in EVs, which as we've talked about, aren't perfect, but are a step in the right direction. So that's all I have for you on this new announcement of the Binational Electric Vehicle Corridor. That's cool. I'm hoping that we can see more from that. Uh, yeah. So what do you have for us next? Yeah, so next up, we have a report by NPR, National Public Radio. I love National Public Radio. Yeah, they're good people over there. <laughs> the, uh, the, so the, the Biden administration came out with um, a promise that federal agencies would no longer be subsidizing fossil fuels overseas. That was something that he said when he took office, and that's been something that's been largely held up to. This sounds like really good news, Anton. It's I'm good excited news. to hear this. Yeah, it's great news. Uh, it, that's that's big progress for America. Um, although there is kind of one little hiccup. There mm -hmm. was a federal agency called the America's Import Export Bank. Uh, they actually recently lent a hundred million dollars to Indonesia to create or expand in an oil refinery in I their country. Should have known that you couldn't just give me a happy story. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, that's the way it goes sometimes. Yeah. Um, and obviously, this isn't great. We don't want to keep furthering our uh, fossil fuels or climate change, you know, on, pa on taxpayer dime. Uh, but I'm kind of just interested in, in unpackaging this with you. Yeah. Like, what is, what is it that America's Import-Export Bank makes them so much more open to not being regulated by the president or, you know. Uh, they're essentially saying, like, this rule doesn't apply to us. Yeah. Maybe they're asking for forgiveness instead of for permission. Yes. That's exactly what this sounds like. Like, when I was a little kid and I would just be like, I'm just going to take a cookie and see if anybody notices. Yeah, right. And the Biden administration is not, like, smacking their hand and yeah. saying, like, no cookies until after dinner, no investments in foreign fossil fuels. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm kind of hoping that... Uh, there is some follow-up from NPR. Uh, it's great that they brought this to our attention, kind of like blew the whistle a little bit. Yeah. I would love to see maybe some recourse and maybe uh, the promise taken maybe one step further or a policy being put in place to make sure that this really doesn't happen. 
Uh, yeah. And I think it's interesting, too, you mentioned, like, this was a, a promise, a campaign promise, an early presidential promise. Um, and so when we think about the fact that if this is a, a federal agency, we, you and me and other taxpayers, are lending that $100 million. And yeah. Our taxes go towards all sorts of things, some that we may agree with and some that we don't, but we vote for people to represent us who are most aligned with our interests and our priorities. And so if we voted for Biden saying we are interested in defunding international fossil fuels, then essentially our vote has been sort of co-opted by an agency that says, we don't really care what you prioritize. We're going to do what we want to do. There needs to be a little bit more oversight there. And not to mention uh, spending, you know, hundreds uh, or a hundred million dollars on subsidizing fossil fuels probably doesn't really agree with the UN climate goals. Absolutely. uh, Things that would get us closer to keeping earth habitable. Um, So that's... That's all that I have for you there, Shelby. Yeah, it's a good um, update. I hope that we can keep our viewers updated more on this as it progresses. Absolutely. We'll have to uh, be the whistleblowers going forward if we see other agencies that are making these kinds of investments. So yeah. thanks for bringing it to our attention and thinking 100%. through how we, the taxpayers and the voters, are, can really stay up to date on what happens with the promises that yeah. are made to us. 100%. All right. Well, you want to move on to another, our final policy and gov segment for the day? Yes, I would love to. Okay, great. So this mostly came out of an article from the Washington Post. That's my main resource for today. So in May of 2023, the U.S. Senate voted to remove protections for the northern long-eared bat. Have you ever seen Mm. a picture of this bat? Uh, I think I actually have. I I had a little bit of a bat phase. (laughs) How does that not surprise me? (laughs) Listen, I love furry creatures of all kinds. Um, Bats are the squirrels of the sky, really. And I I love little creatures like that. Um, This bat in particular is very cute and very small. So um, it's also endangered, probably more importantly. And so the Senate has decided to overturn its status as, uh, or really I should say, remove the protections from it as an endangered species. Um, And there's a lot to go into with this. So I'm going to kind of talk at you, but just feel free to interrupt oh, as we go. So <laughs> first of all, why? Why would the Senate care about this one bat, right? That seems like the obvious question. Yeah. It's because of the timber industry. Mm. So when you protect a species, you're normally protecting their habitat yeah. because they need a place to live and make more of themselves. <laughs> um but this bat exists in 37 states and they live in forests. And so the timber industry says these bats, the protections on the bats are getting in the way of our progress in doing our job. We don't mm. want to delay logging activities because we're not allowed to uh, log in the vicinity of these bats. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. So that's where they're coming from. That's specifically being lobbied by the Federal Forest Resource Coalition. Wow. Um, And they specifically worked with a Republican from Minnesota to introduce the resolution to the GOP-led House. So the House passed immediately the overturning of this. But the surprise for me was that it also passed in the Senate, as we said. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the Senate does have the majority in the House. Or (laughs) the Senate does have the majority of Democrats. Democrats have the majority in the Senate, is what I really was trying to say. Yeah. But two Democrats... um, Joe Manchin and Amy Klobuchar both voted in favor of removing these protections. Wow. And Amy Klobuchar is from? Uh, she's from Minnesota. Yeah, and okay. Manchin's so from makes sense. Yeah. West Virginia. West Virginia. So yeah. what do you know about those states? What stands out to you, the comparison well, between West Virginia and Minnesota? Well, I'm sure that they're both heavily involved in logging and timber. So. Exactly. Ah, that's a bummer. It's a bummer. And actually, Amy Klobuchar has like a 90% rating on from the American Conservation League. So she's normally really interested in conservation. So this was uh, sort of a, a, a difference for her to decide to vote in favor of removing these protections, whereas we see this more from Manchin on a regular basis. He's uh, a more in-the-middle-of-the-road Democrat in yeah. the Senate um, and has always been really protective of the industry in his state. Um, I also want to talk about like why, why they're deciding to uh, overturn this or like what their argument is. So... The advocates who want to remove the protections say that actually the big deal for these bats isn't that they don't have anywhere to live. 
Um, it's a fungus. So oh, they the, get this thing called, were well, you going to say something? Was it like white nose Yes. Syndrome? Yeah. I knew you'd know. Oh, yeah, thanks. White nose syndrome. <laughs> it comes from a fungus. Yeah. And so all of the advocates who are saying, oh, we should overturn this. That's not the protection they need. Say, we have no evidence that protecting their habitat reduces this fungus. Um, mm. But I think that misses the point. And uh, conservation groups would agree with me that. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if there's also a syndrome that is reducing the population. You will further reduce the population if they lose habitat. Yeah, 100%. Plus where that fungus maybe hasn't spread, it could be some of those areas where they're logging or, or timbering, whatever the, the phrase, the verbiage is, logging, timbering. I think logging <laughs> Logging, <works>. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also kind of want to talk about the mechanism by which this was was pushed through. So this was through a Congressional Review Act, um, mm. which has never been used in this way before to specifically overturn something for one species. Yeah. Um, it was also recently used to remove protections overall for a prairie chicken, the lesser prairie chicken. No, I've heard of them. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you have. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, this is sort of unprecedented that Congress is using this this power to specifically target particular animals. And an advocacy group called the Defenders of Wildlife says, and I'll quote this, this is an alarming and dangerous trend. Mm. Um, it's important to note that Biden says that he's gonna veto these resolutions if they hit his desk or when they hit his desk. But that would be amazing. It would be great. Um, he'd be talking about the bat resolution, the lesser prairie, um, and then also when Biden took office, his administration expanded the definition of a critical habitat, and that has also been voted to be overturned. So I, I agree with the Defenders of Wildlife group. This yeah. is alarming to me. It seems like we're sort of rolling down this hill of saying, mm, we're going to step back from protecting animals to instead prioritize yeah. industry. Yeah, and I don't want to create too much of a slippery slope argument, but if they're willing to do this for a bat or a bird, you know, what else are they willing to do this for? And as we've talked before on the show, yeah. we know that when you're affecting one thing in the ecosystem, it's going to affect other things and eventually lead to affecting our own health. So that's scary. Yeah, it is scary. And it's not that I don't respect the idea that industry is a key part of our like economic system. It drives uh, jobs for people. It, it also is just yeah. a, a way of life in some places. But we need to be able to balance the idea yes. of like protecting because we've talked about this even last week when we talked about the salmon and how we were mm -hmm. finding protections in Seattle. Am I right? Yes, you're right. To protect salmon because we recognized that they themselves sort of have a right to exist, but they're also part of this larger ecosystem. So when salmon are failing to reproduce, to create more salmon, yeah. to thrive, that affects people and their ability to eat. It affects the quality of the water system. Yeah. And the same can be said for these bats. So you're living in a forest and bats are eating the bugs. They are a, a key part of the ecosystem yeah. of those forests. And one species really does have an impact. And I've actually been told it gets pretty buggy in the summers there in Minnesota. So you want to keep those bats around. I think so too. <laughs> I also, I love a good bat. When I lived in Austin, there was this um, huge population of bats that lived under all of the bridges. Yeah. And people would literally come to Austin to see the bats that would come out when the sun went down Ooh. from under the bridges. Millions of them would fly into the sky. And it was like the most glorious thing to watch. Um, so that's, that's what comes to mind for me when I think about them. Not the same species of bat, but just they themselves have a right to exist. Um, and I want us to protect them. So here's hoping that Biden is able to veto all of these resolutions uh, and make sure that we continue to protect these animals because yeah. they're a key part of our ecosystem. That sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, do you want to tell our audience how they can keep up to date with us? I would love to. Great. If you'd like to stay connected to us, be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at One Planet Media. That's O N E 1. And if you'd like to rewatch full episodes, check out our YouTube channel, All Things Green Show. You can find all of our sources from today's episode in the show notes. We'll be back at the same time next week to bring you more news. Thank you for being a part of the global sustainability movement. Felt short to me. Thank you.